when this great crisis hit, the people in charge, the economic advisors, had no clue what to do. That's partly because they were never required in their training, as I was never required, to understand what economic collapse capitalism produces, to go through the history of how that has happened in the past, what government programs worked and didn't, none of that was understood. They were winging it, and we are all living with the results. So let me turn then, as best I can, to an overview of what this crisis is, why it happened, why what the government is doing doesn't work, and where that leaves us. I'm not going to throw snippets at you. That you have the mainstream media for. They will tell you this piece of information and that one on this day or that one, making sure it adds up to mostly confusion and after a while loss of interest. I'm going to try to do something different to make it hang together to give you an overview. And I'm going to try to do it in such a way that at key moments in my presentation, I will give you examples of how things could have happened otherwise, how alternatives exist even if our leaders make a point of not considering them. Where does it all begin? Well, on some level, it's our whole history as a nation. But you have to start somewhere, so I'm going to start in the 1970s because something fundamental changed in the United States that most of us, and I suspect most of you may still not have come to terms with. What do I mean? For at least a hundred years before the 1970s, United States capitalism was absolutely unique. It was unique because it delivered to its workers a rising real wage. Real wage means the amount of money you get for an hour of work adjusted for the prices you have to pay. So when you make that adjustment, are you able to buy more things or not? The reality was for a hundred years before the 1970s, wages in America, the real wage, went up decade over decade. Why do I stress that? Because we're the only capitalism about whom that can be said. A hundred years of rising wages allowing the American working class a standard of living not achieved anywhere else. Why? Well, the answer is really simple. We had for a hundred years a labor shortage. Capitalism in this country had a vir virtually virgin territory, given what we did to the people who were here when we arrived. And we had a very rich country, rich in resources. We had a successful capitalism that continuously didn't have enough people. And the only way to deal with that problem for employers was to raise the wages. It was the reason waves of immigrants came here, hoping for a better life than what they had where they were. And hearing what was happening in the United States, not quite believing it, they made that risky and dangerous and costly decision to uproot themselves and come here, but they did get a rising standard of living based on rising wages. The employers here not only had to raise the wage to bring folks here, but they had to keep the wages rising in order to hold on to their employees since they could at any time run away, travel west, get land, start again. Very difficult for our employers to get around the rock-bottom need to raise wages. So the rise of the United States to a big capitalist power was premised on constantly raising wages. Let me do that again. The way we became a rich, powerful, capitalist country in the hundred years before the 1970s was by being unique in the history of capitalism by providing our workers with rising wages. Keep that in mind the next time a representative of the Chamber of Commerce comes to you and explains why wages really shouldn't be allowed to rise here in the United States because it would hurt our international competitiveness. It worked real well for a century. What happened in the 1970s? Again, it's pretty simple. The labor shortage stopped. Why? Several things. One, we invented a computer, which puts an awful lot of people out of work. 
It replaces human beings on a scale. Really, we've had very few inventions that have done that. And that really took hold in our production processes in the 1970s. Number two, American corporations discovered that between the development in the rest of the world and the computer, it was now profitable to move production out of the United States on a massive scale that had never happened before. In the 70s and 80s, it was mostly manufacturing that got moved out of the country. Now it's mostly service jobs, jobs for which people have skills and have education, and we're just at the beginning of that process. India, China, and other places are where it's going. So what did we have in the 70s? We had fewer jobs needed because the computer did so much, fewer jobs needed because our corporations are moving out en masse. But we also had a very powerful social movement, the women's liberation movement in the 70s and 80s, in which millions of women decided they would no longer accept the gender division of the workplace and they wanted in, and they moved in, in large numbers. So we had this extraordinary circumstance. Fewer jobs, more people looking. If you're a capitalist, even if you haven't gone to a business school, you know that if you don't have to raise wages, because the labor shortage has become a labor excess, then you're stupid if you do it. American employers everywhere starting in the 1970s, stopped raising wages. And by the way, they did that on Main Street every bit as much as they did it on Wall Street. I know it is popular to imagine that Main Street has virtue and Wall Street doesn't. But in terms of what happened in this country, they're equally wonderful or equally horrible. I'll leave that to your decision. But equal is the key word. Across the United States, wages stopped, which means I can announce the following statistic if you've never heard it. The real wage, that is what the average American worker gets today, adjusted for the prices he or she has to pay, here in 2011, is what it was in 1978. There's been no increase in the average real wage of the American working class. And that had never been true before, basically, in the history of the country. So the 1970s changed everything. It's a watershed. The society changed in a fundamental way that meant the American working class would no longer have a rising wage. And therefore, it faced a great decision well, will we therefore just stop and not have a better situation? The American dream of living better each generation is over. We'll announce to our kids that the promises that were implicit in their upbringing, that they'd have a college education, are now no longer operative. We didn't have such a national conversation in the 1970s. We pretended nothing was going on. We didn't deal with this social transformation as if it were that. We dealt with a social transformation as if it were an individual problem. And we went about as individuals, something we pride ourselves about here in this country, by trying to find an individual solution. And most Americans found the following two solutions. One, if I'm not going to get more wages per hour, I know, more hours. So American men took a second or third job. American women were already taking jobs. Old people came out of retirement, and young kids did a job on the afternoon and the weekend. Here's another statistic about how this worked. Over the last 30 years, the United States has zoomed to the number one position in the, United, in the world. Americans do more hours of paid labor per year than any other people in any other country on the earth. That was not true 50 years ago. In Germany, France, and Italy, the average number of hours of labor done per year is 20% less than here. That's a day a week. So when some of you who have the resources travel to France and Italy, 
and come back with wonderful stories about their culture and how they sit and have meals for four hours and drink lovely wine and 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 this has nothing to do with culture this has to do with time (laughs) they have it we don't they celebrate slow food movements we invented fast food but we have no time So Americans have become exhausted and show all the physical and mental signs of exhaustion from that kind of labor. When you put together the extra labor and the fact that the women are crucial to the story, then the emotional holding together of the American family also begins to unravel in the 1970s. We become a nation that has epidemics of child abuse, spouse abuse, hell, you know the story. The dysfunctional family becomes a cultural icon on television millions of hours. Not Ozzie and Harriet, but you know all of those funny programs about how people can hardly stand each other. And an interesting thing, as we become exhausted physically and stressed emotionally, the other way the American individual responds to this social crisis individually is by going on a borrowing binge no working class in the history of the world had ever done before. The savings rate in the United States went to zero. And Americans began to borrow more and more. Well, it doesn't take a genius or an actuarial degree to know that if the wages are not going up and the debts are going up, it's going to be pretty soon that you can't sustain the debts. You can't pay the interest and the amortization on a flat wage basis. 2007 is the year when the transformation of the 1970s could no longer be postponed. You couldn't maintain a rising consumption on your debts and your exhausted work anymore. Americans physically can't do more work and nobody will ever lend them money again the way they did in the last 30 years because, as we now know, they can't pay it back. We're done. We are in a crisis now that isn't a short one, isn't a quick blip down, isn't V-shaped or U-shaped, the way economists like to say, because in a sense, it's the fruit of this entire country's history, the way I've just summarized it for you. That's why it's not going away anytime soon. That's why you shouldn't be surprised if the recovery is something you read about in the newspaper but never see anywhere else in your life.